Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode nine of Cold War Conversations. Firstly, thank you to everyone who has posted such kind reviews. I'm delighted that people seem to be liking the podcast and I'd like to encourage others to do the same so that we can grow the audience. Also, if you haven't already joined, there's a vibrant discussion group growing on Facebook. Just search for Cold War Conversations. OK, let's get on to the subject of today's podcast. Mark Baker is an independent journalist and travel writer who's lived in Central Europe for more than two decades. I heartily recommend his travel website, markbakerprague.com, which is an eclectic mix of stories about his adopted hometown of Prague and stories from when Central Europe was the Eastern Bloc and he was a full-time journalist trying his best to cover it. Mark tells an intriguing and compelling story, and I do urge you to listen right to the end. I hope you enjoy our chat, and I welcome Mark Baker. Hello, Mark. How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm very good. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on Cold War Conversations. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, well, at the moment, I am a travel writer and a blogger, and I've been a travel writer for about 10 years now. And then prior to being a travel writer, uh, I was a journalist for about 20 years, 15, 20 years, something like that. And when people ask me what I do, I still say I'm a journalist. I uh, came across you via your um, blog and was fascinated by some of the stories on there, and particularly about your experiences in Prague in the 1980s. You know, I had just graduated from university in New York City, and I had done a concentration in Eastern European Studies, and this was in 1986. And uh, if you can just go into the time machine and think about how job prospects would have been for a person in Eastern European Studies in the mid-1980s, you know, there was essentially nothing. Uh, you could enter the State Department, of course, um, but uh, aside from that, there was really no there was no really there was no real option to go into the private sector and, and work in, in Eastern Europe. Um, so um, you know, I was very lucky. Uh, I was living in New York, uh, and I just took the first job that came my way. It happened to be a small research and publishing company based in Manhattan. And uh, when I got there, I was shocked to find that they had a publication called Business Eastern Europe. I had never heard of it. I didn't know anything about it. So, you know, I worked in Manhattan uh, for this. This company was called Business International. It was uh, a publishing company that was relatively small. And what it, did, what it did at the time was to publish information for use by companies all around the world. So, you know, there was a business Eastern Europe. There was also business Africa, business Latin America. There were all kinds of businesses back then. And, uh, I, you know, I worked there for a little while and I saw the business Eastern Europe uh, publication. And of course, I started to push and push and push. Of course, I had the background in it. And eventually they relented and they sent me to their office in Vienna, which is where they did all of their reporting uh, on Eastern Europe from. What was Vienna like at the time? And what, what were your co-workers like? I mean, what, what was that office like as well? Well, you know, it, it's a funny company. You probably have never heard of it, I'm sure, you know, or maybe you, you have. But um, you know, it was later purchased by the Economist Group. So I had the great fortune of uh, going from Business International to working for the Economist Group without ever having to change uh, occupations. And I didn't have to change my desk. Uh, so, you know, I got very, very lucky. But uh, when I moved there in 1986, it was a 10 man team. It was kind of like the island of misfit toys. And, you know, I considered myself to be somewhat of a misfit to, you know, to do this concentration in Eastern European studies. 
Um, the people, my, my colleagues at the, at the office were, you know, I would say similar to me in certain respects, um, relatively young, uh, a mix of Anglophones. There was a guy from Scotland there, some guys from Britain in the company, uh, a bunch of Americans. And, uh, you know, our job was to uh, cover uh, communist, the communist Eastern Bloc for this, uh, for this company. And your boss sounds like quite an interesting character. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I remember just from the question that you asked me also about Vienna. So let me just talk a little bit about Vienna at the time, because I think your listeners are going to be in for a surprise. Um, you know, Vienna in the 1980s, you know, we, we look at Vienna now in 2018 as a beautiful city, fantastic place to visit, great coffee museums. You know, it's always number one in those, where am I going to retire? Where could I live? Lists that they publish. In the 1980s, it was a little bit different. It was still, I would say, still slowly recovering from World War II, even though this was, you know, well on from the war. But, you know, Austria was occupied until the mid-1950s. It was like Berlin, in a sense. It was occupied by the four powers. And uh, in 1955, I believe it was, Austria cut a deal to become an independent country. But as part of that deal, it pledged permanent neutrality. So Austria was really very much firmly wedged between East and West. And it felt like that. You know, we used to call it um, you know, 40 kilometers west of Bratislava, because it really felt like it was kind of a Western outpost in the Eastern Bloc. Yeah, because if you look at it on the map, it's quite surprising how deep Vienna is in what was sort exactly. of like Warsaw Pact territory, effectively. Exactly. And it looks a little bit like an Eastern European country, in a sense, from the architecture, because, of course, a lot of the East European countries were former Austrian Habsburg territories, you know, so... It was in the milieu. And, of course, the Czechoslovaks were hardline communists, but, you know, go back a generation or two. And the Czechs, the Bohemians, are part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So the cultural connections were there as well. So, you know, it was a weird, it was a weird Western European city like that. And, and now my, my boss there, right? That, that's what you're asking. Yeah, 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 yeah. He sounds oh, okay. fascinating. <laughs> okay. Well... It was a twelve, a ten or twelve man operation, right? Okay, he was um, a captain in the uh, in the U.S. Army who had served in the Vietnam War, um, but a very nuanced character. He wrote spy novels in his spare time. He's still alive. He lives in Virginia. Very, very nice man. Very smart man. And um, you know he, you know he, you know he had a kind of military bearing to him. To, to to you know himself um but and, and also very square in a sense you know ex-army you could kind of see that but he had all these side interests you know like the spy novel stuff and kind of the fine living kind of thing uh that was he was very very difficult to pigeonhole as any kind of person and he was a very well-read guy so um but it was his penchant for writing spy novels picture this we're a small operation, a Western publishing outfit in Vienna. We write about Eastern Europe, and our boss is writing spy novels about Eastern Europe. I mean, they all take place in the Cold War, basically all of his novels. And for those reasons, I mean, it was either the most elaborate front operation you could possibly imagine, or it was just weird. You know, we were a cell for the CIA. I mean, obviously, you know, that kind of thing. So, but, um, Well, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, you must have been... I don't know, highly or perceived as highly suspect by, um, you know, I, I came into this after graduating from college. Right. So I was extremely naive. You know, I knew that I wasn't working for the CIA and if I was, they owe me a lot of back pay because, you know, I was never told about that. Yeah. And that state pension as well. You must, I know I get that state pension. Exactly. (laughs) But I, I I learned later on by my colleagues, uh, you know, who had a little bit more experience in these matters. In fact, one of my former colleagues who actually saw one of his files, uh, that the Czechoslovaks had care had, had kept on him when he was, he actually was the guy I replaced when I came over in 1986. Um, he told me later over drinks that he got to see his file in Prague and it was filled with observations and all kinds of um, assumptions on the Czechoslovak state security side that indeed we were obviously front operation for the Central Intelligence Agency. And, uh, you know, I think that's why in the end I got assigned this this guy that we'll talk about later to cover me when I went to Prague. The Czechoslovaks legitimately thought that we were spies. Wow. 
So how, how did you get to Prague? I mean, from, from Vienna, how did you travel there? Uh, you know, um, most of the day-to-day life we had at this publishing company was exactly what I said it was. You know, we would, we would go over newspapers, we would look for deals or any news that would that would be coming out of the Eastern Bloc. And when I say newspapers, I mean the Financial Times or Handelsblatt, sometimes the local newspapers in the Eastern European countries. You know, I was assigned to read Ruta Bravo, even though my check wasn't very good at the time. In fact, practically non-existent. Um, so, um, you know, it was a very dry office affair. We would be combing through the newspapers, trying to look for, um, for pieces of news, like economic news that would interest our clients and readers who were reading our publications. But occasionally, twice a year, three times a year, if we were lucky, we got to sign to go in-country. And for me, that meant to go up to Prague. So say between 1986 and 1990, when I left that company, you know, I made probably 10 trips, so eight, 10, eight, nine, 10, something like that, trips to Prague or Brno or even Bratislava uh, to report on events on the ground for our magazine and our company. We were very much discouraged from taking our own vehicles, driving, anything like that. I don't know why exactly. I didn't ask too many questions at the time, but you know, we would almost always go up on the train or I was going to Brno that actually at the time the bus connection from Vienna was better than the train connection. Um, so, uh, you know, that was a complete adventure on its own in a sense back in going up to Prague for, on the train from Vienna, say 1987 or 1988. I understand that you used to have um, a regular uh, traveling companion who oh. used to uh, find you as well. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, let me take you through just one typical, quickly take you through one, say, typical trip from from Prague, uh, from Vienna up to Prague. Um, okay. The train doesn't go the, the route that it goes now. You know, the, 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 the time that goes, the time from, the train time from Vienna to Prague these days is four hours. The train goes through Brno. It's a very logical route when you look at it on the map. Back in those days, I don't know for what reason, the train started off by going northwest from Vienna through central Austria and then up through Bohemia to Prague. I mean, you know, the, the route took about five hours or so. and I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it was because of the border controls that would go on. We would always pull up to the Czech border. It was a town called Česka Velenice. It was a, a little Berlin in the sense that it was also divided by the Cold War. It has a sister city in Austria called Gemünd that's right across the border. Anyway, we would sit in Česka Velenice for about an hour. You know, of course, the customs people would board the train. The You know, they would look for, you know, the, the passport people, all that stuff. Uh, they would probably search the train for anybody that was coming in or out that they didn't know about or any contraband that was coming on the train. Um, and then we would start chugging our way up to Prague. We, by this time, we were firmly in Czechoslovakia and several times, and it never varied how it would happen. We would be chugging along. The train was practically empty, um, and there would be a, a sultry-looking woman walking up and down the corridor, looking, obviously, for an empty compartment. Of course, all the compartments were basically empty. She would stop at my compartment, sort of knock on the door, pull open the compartment door and ask in very basic check if that seat was free. Of course, you know, I'm looking forward to a a nice companion on the train. Why not? Of course it's free. Sit down. Um, And then she would sort of take the seat directly opposite me, never any other seat in the compartment. We would lock eyes. She would flutter her eyebrows. And then at that point she would say, "Um, I hear something funny in your accent. Are you... Uh, not Czech, or are you English speaker by any chance? And, and when you say sultry, Mark, I think you're yes. probably saying quite good looking. Then yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I mean, and being grad okay. student, you're not, you know, you're you're quite flattered by this attention. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Who wouldn't be? I mean, you know, <laughs> I I I was amazed at my luck with Czech women. I mean, I didn't have the same you know amount of luck with Austrian women, you know, or whatever, but. Um, you know, we would start that nice conversation and, uh, you know, it was just basic stuff, you know, oh, where are you from? Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that would help me pass the time. And of course, we would pull into the train station in in, uh, in Prague and, um, you know, I would turn around and she was gone. You know, so, so what do you think the purpose of her um, conversation was then? Oh, you know, um, well, I, <laughs> I'll tell you something that is in the blog in a second, but... Uh, 
you know, it took me a while, of course, you know, I think your listeners are going to wonder, of course, you know, how, how can a person be so naive not to know this? But I really thought at the time that it was just, you know, what it was, basically. Um, you know, in retrospect, after a lot of thinking about it, and then I actually met one of these girls by chance in Prague a few years later, so I had a chance to really talk to her about what she was doing. But, you know, it was obvious. She was retained by the state, probably not a formal employee of the security services or anything, but, you know, um, you know, somebody that was whose services, whose English was used and whose looks uh, was used by the regime to meet foreigners coming across the border to make sure that they didn't meet anybody on the train, that they didn't take any gifts or any packages, that they didn't give anything away. I mean, these were, you know, obvious things that they had to guard against. And um, her job was to take me to my fixer in Prague and, and, and get lost. And basically, that's what she did. Wow. Okay. So, yes, on, on to your, uh, your fixer who, you know, set up your meetings and basically arranged everything for you in, in Prague. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is the, this individual is the subject of my blog post that you read. It's actually, I wrote it in three parts. It's quite long, but uh, I divided into three parts because I wanted to tell the story of, of me in Vienna, of course, what I was doing there and then how I would, uh, and then how I came into contact with this individual. And then in the third, uh, in the third part of the blog, a bit of denouement, what happened to him in the end. And the man we're talking about is my fixer at the time, and his name was Arnold. His name was Arnold Kylberth. Uh, he passed away in 2001, so was is the correct is the correct verb tense here. Um, yeah. So Arnold Arnold was retained by Business International. He was one of several uh, local individuals in the Eastern European countries at the time who would help us to arrange our hotel stays uh, in country when we visited. He would help us to uh, um, arrange our interviews. You know, he had a car here. He could help me with transportation. And, you know, me in particular, some of my other colleagues at Business International actually spoke the languages of the countries they covered. But, you know, my check was very rudimentary at the time. So Arnold was also my translator. Well, what was he like? I mean, did you get to know him quite well? Well, you know, well, as I said at the beginning, you know, I traveled uh, seven, eight, nine times to, uh, to Prague over the course of a couple of years. And, um, you know, go back to those, those times, you know, pre-internet, uh, we were actually doing all of our negotiating over telex machine in 1986, and 1987 fax machines hadn't really started up at that point. Of, the, of course, there was no email back then either. Um, so it was so important for small companies like ours to have local individuals on the ground in the countries who could do so many things that we couldn't do from Vienna. And, uh, so, you know, uh, that was, uh, you know, that, you know, he, his role was so important that, uh, that, you know, when I did go to Prague, of course, you know, we were, you know, we were right and left hand of the same person, basically we were, you know, he helped me in every way, you know, picked me up at the hotel, took me from the train station to the hotel, helped me sign in, took me to my first meeting, to my second meeting, we went to lunch to the third, to the afternoon meeting, maybe for a beer after work take me to my hotel, repeat the next day. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time with him. I got to know him pretty well. Okay. And did, did the older hands in Business International not sort of tell you to be wary or, or anything like that? You know, or I, Again, you have to go back to those days. It was such a delicate question to ask. I never asked my own colleagues if they were spies or something. I, you know, in a sense, I suppose, you know, it's probably easier to talk about these guys. But, yeah, we talked a little bit among ourselves uh-huh. Okay. So they're, you know, they must have some kind of connection to the regime if they have the freedom to interact with Western journalists who have great contacts. I mean, you know, Arnold would routinely get uh, get uh, interviews for me with the Minister of, of Economy or the Minister of Foreign Trade. We went to the very highest people. Um, so you have to ask yourself, you know, you know, what kind of individual who's not working for the regime would have this kind of access um, but the a kind of official story that these guys kind of told to me and told to us and told to my bosses were that, you know, that they were former communists or perhaps still communists, but um, that they had been somehow, you know, treated poorly by the regime or discredited by the regime, but were allowed to work on the side to pick up some income, to use their language skills and, to, you know, 
and, and somehow this seemed to be a logical explanation at the time. Don't ask me why. I and, and did, it. No. and did Arnold sort of allude to that at all? Or was he just very professional in his business dealings and just tried to be your friend there and well, didn't really you know, mention anything about the regime? You know, you can't talk about uh, economics, you know, for very long over beers. And you start talking about, you know, uh, you know, I met Arnold's uh, wife. I met Arnold's daughter. I ate dinner at his house. Um, you know, I would ask him questions. He, I think at one time he told me that his father was the Czechoslovak ambassador to Canada, which, you know, doesn't appear to be in any of the newspapers that I had ever seen. So that was obviously some kind of story that he had made up. Um, yeah, no, he, he looked, he looked and acted very much the part. He didn't seem to be very committed to the regime. At the same time, he didn't seem to be very critical to the regime. You know, he played his cards very close to the vest, as, as they all did, and as I suppose I did as well. Um, you know, obviously, we were thrilled, in a sense, in Vienna. We were so excited about the breath of fresh air that Mikhail Gorbachev and Perestroika Glasnost had brought into the Eastern European dynamic with the West. Um, so I would ask him about that, and he would, you know, he would mimic enthusiasm for that thing, although I can't imagine that he was all that enthusiastic about it, because that would mean profound changes for him. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, my, my, my own recollections is that, you know, of, of these conversations is that, of course, we talked about politics, but, you know, I guess I didn't dive too deeply there. I didn't really want to know everything. Well, I guess you didn't want to screw up your best sort of contact over there who was taking you to all these great meetings, I suppose. It, exactly. And I, and I also didn't, you know, I, I got the feeling in Vienna when I would talk to my bosses and ask directly, you know, who this Arnold guy was. And all of all of us had their own string of relationships with people in their own countries. We had a guy in Hungary, a guy in Sofia, a guy in Warsaw, a guy in Belgrade. So, and these guys were basically all the same. You know, somewhere in their indeterminate fifties, all seemed to be a little bit dour. You know, didn't none of them seemed to be doing that well. So it was kind of credible. You know, this was a kind of a, a ragtag outfit of, of of guys who had language skills and contacts from their old lives that they could help us get some inroads. Right. And, uh, you know, my boss, I think my boss told me at one time, Will, the, you know, the army captain, he told me, um, look, you have to assume when you go up there that they're going to be watching you. You have to behave yourself. You know, you don't put yourself into a situation where you can be blackmailed or bribed. Um, and then I said, well, you know, what about Arnold? I said, well, you know, we don't know. You know, we don't want to know in a sense, because if they did know, wouldn't it redound, redound poorly on that company to have hired uh, an active agent from the opposing side, <laughs> you know? So there was a kind of don't ask, don't tell aspect to it. If you can imagine that. Yeah, no, I can. I can. Absolutely. So um, you mentioned that he got you interviews with some quite high level um, communist oh, absolutely. politicians. Yes. Um, you know, did so, so they were all in the commercial area, presumably these politicians. Right. Well, you know, we are, our, our publication was called business eastern europe so we were really focused on trade foreign trade we were interested in economics so my job when i came to prague as a reporter as a reporter as a journalist not as an agent was to um was to interview trade representatives officials economic uh, officials to find out what czechoslovakia was going to be importing in the coming year where their where their spending priorities were where their export priorities were I mean, this was valuable information for companies that read our publication and, uh, you know, and, 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 and um, you know, followed our, our company. Uh, we, you know, we were trying to bring real value by giving them information that they couldn't have gotten, you know, by themselves. So did you get to see some of the business enterprises that were out there as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, um, Arnold had a car. Um, we were... You know, I, I, I found these, um, these meetings with trade representatives and ministers to be rather dry, probably, you know, in good measure because I couldn't follow along perfectly in Czech. And uh, so, you know, I could ask the questions, but I really had to wait for Arnold to translate them for me. And of course, you know, who knows what Arnold was telling me and whether he was faithfully translating what my sources were telling us or, you know, whether it was just a, you know, a total game. Um, but yeah, um, we also went all over the country. We were driving in Hishkoda everywhere. We would go to the Brno, the Brno Trade Fair in April. That was a big event in, in Eastern Europe at the time. All of the big Eastern European companies and a lot of the Western companies 
would uh, would meet and make deals at the at the trade fair. And um, I suppose you're alluding to uh, you know our trip to the Slushovitsa Agro Combinat or Agro. Comb- I'm glad you pronounced that. I wasn't even <laughs> going to try, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go back again, back into the 1980s. You know, we have Gorbachev, who's pushing these Eastern European countries to loosen up a little bit. Not maybe not Gorbachev himself, but I mean, the whole dynamic of the Gorbachev thing is to try to find some kind of middle way, you know, between the hardline communist governments um, like Czechoslovakia, like East Germany, to get them to try to improve their economic efficiency, to become more economically viable. And this particular, um, I'll call it a cooperative farm, although that's, you know, perhaps a little bit misleading, um, was the darling of the Czechoslovak government at the time. This was a, a cooperative farm that had um, developed some, from its from its agricultural activities, had developed some good pesticides, some good chemicals, and they had somehow parlayed that expertise into all kinds of crazy operations. They were assembling PCs they were running a horse racing track. They were running a test track for German automobiles. They had a small domestic airline that they were doing. I mean, this was a company whose turnover was measured in the hundreds of millions of dollars at a time when those numbers were unheard of in Czechoslovakia. So the Financial Times, you know, had adopted it as this kind of third way, honorable, you know, thing. The New York Times, everybody was writing about this thing. So, you know, I told Arnold, hey, we're going to go to Slushovitz and see what's going on there. And so that was one of my last, that was practically on my last trip to Czechoslovakia. I think that was in the spring of 1989 when we went out there. The funny thing is, and maybe I, and I allude to it in my blog post, it was basically a front operation. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, sure, they were doing those activities, but the numbers were nothing like what they were actually generating. So it was a bit of a fraud. And it was taken down within the first few years after the fall of the uh, of, of the communist regime in 1989, and uh, you know that says just volumes about what was going on in those all those countries at that time, and you know in the 1980s, and uh, trying so hard to look like they're you know making economic progress at the same time, you know building the whole thing on a heap of lies. So you you said you were at the uh, agro combinat. Um, and I won't try and pronounce it. Um, say, yeah, go, yeah go j- just it. before yeah, okay. or, or in 1989. So, what right. what was the atmosphere in Prague and Czechoslovakia just before the Velvet Revolution? Did it feel right. like it was a bit of a powder keg? No, not at all. Um, everybody was nervous. You know, think about the year 1989. We had Hungary in the spring. Then, by the early summer, we had Poland with the elections that that allowed for the first non-communist parties in the government. Uh, and then we had that long summer, and then we had the buildup in Germany, and, and then we had the fall of the Berlin Wall, it, it followed by a lot of unrest in eastern Germany, places like Leipzig. So um, I had the pleasure of going up to Prague in early November before the Berlin Wall fell. I was sent up there by, I didn't really meet with Arnold for some reason on this trip, I don't know why, but I was sent up there just at last minute uh, from Vienna by a business international. And my job was to ask Czechs, Czechoslovaks, I guess we call them at the time, uh, whether they thought that what was going on in, in Berlin, there were obviously there was unrest there and the, the things that happened in Poland and Hungary before that, whether they thought that there was any chance that it could happen in Prague. And to the last man, this was the first days of November. So three weeks or two and a half weeks before the start of the Velvet Revolution, to the last man in Prague, everybody said, it will never happen. Right. And and never was happen. Husak still in power then? Was that Husak? Yes. yes. So, and he was the successor to Dubček in 68. So he'd been there quite some time. The the Czechoslovak government, the communist government, was one of, considered to be one of the staunchest supporters of communism, the most hard line, you might call it, along with the East Germans. And there was really no indication from the government uh, that there was going to be any type of weakening. You know, of course, like I said earlier, there was that kind of irresistible force that was being, that was coming ironically from the Soviet Union to reform, but they were pushing back pretty hard not to reform, you know, or or at least resisting the opportunity, the, 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 the the impulse to, to change. But 
in one thing to keep in mind. Uh, I think we don't think about this very much when we think about the revolutions, but all of the Eastern European revolutions, maybe with the exception of Poland, there was no, there was no revolutionary, organized revolutionary force pushing for revolution in any of these countries. You know, the communist governments had succeeded in, in, you know, in, 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 you know, eliminating or in preventing the formation of any type of rival political groups in any of these countries. So when you ask people, is it going to happen here? The first question they ask is, it might, but who's going to do it? It's going to be the people who have to do it. And we're not going to, we're, you know, we're not that kind of person. You know, we're not that kind of people. I think um, had there been a kind of organized resistance or at least a recognized resistance, a group that was opposed to the government, um, then I think that there might have been more confidence that the revolution was coming. But when there isn't that group, then people are like, it might change, but how? It's very difficult to envision. And I think that was the thing that was preventing the revolutions in Eastern Europe at the time. People couldn't actually imagine how the change could happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Velvet Revolution um, right. happens and right. you you don't see Arno again or, or, or what? what, what? You, know, you know, after we went to Slushovica and we had that big trip and, uh, and, and 1989 happened and I went back in November and then the Velvet Revolution happens in November and December of 1989. The, 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 the basically communist free version of Czechoslovakia emerges in 19, at the very beginning of 1990. Um, so you were actually there when the government was overthrown? Or I, I was not. No, I, okay. I missed it. Unfortunately, I was there in early <laughs> November, and uh, in, actually, November seventeenth, the day I was in London, uh, uh, interviewing for a new job, sitting watching it like everyone else on my television in my hotel room. Oh dear. Oh well, that, <laughs> I, that I, I would have thought you if 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 you had been there, that would have been front and center on your blog. But <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, but I, this I is. Did go to, I did go to Berlin, but the day after the, 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 the wall fell, and I did get a little bit of that taste, but no, I totally missed the Velvet Revolution. And I really oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have to have a chat with you about your visit to Berlin at some other point oh, as well okay. then. That, that, sounds, that sounds definitely worth, worth a chat. So, um, so Arno completely disappears. You never see him again? Right. Well, you know, I, um, I, I lived in Vienna until 1991. Um, uh, you know, I was, uh, we were still working at business, inter- business uh, Eastern Europe, Business International was still functioning. Uh, we were still reporting. We were busier than ever. Suddenly, in 1989, companies were coming uh, to us. You know, oh, my God, how do I organize in these countries? You know, now do I set up a joint venture? Do I, do I, do I set up a subsidiary? You know, it was a, it was a, you know, we think of it as a political revolution, but it was also a very much an economic and commercial revolution to do. Everything was changing, the, the laws and that. So we were very busy in 1990. By the time 1990 rolled around, 1991 rolled around, though, I really wanted to get out of Vienna, at least for a little bit, just to, to live, the chance to live in one of these uh, cities that I was, you know, that I was traveling to and covering. And of course, you know, I chose Prague because that's the one that I liked the most and the one that I knew the best. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Prague's a small, uh, small city. I mean, you know, everybody's pushed into a bunch of, you know, 10 small streets, basically in the center of town, but I never really did run into Arnold again until at only one time, uh, by the time the nineties started rolling, um, uh, a few friends of mine and myself, we decided to open up a bookstore and coffee house in Prague. You know, I continued as a journalist, but I, I did this as kind of a side enterprise uh, it was called the Globe, and it you know made a you know big splash. It was a, a combined bookstore coffee house, which was quite a, which was you know quite a a rare a rarity, especially in in Eastern Europe at the time. We sold you know English books, and and um, I don't know, it, it just you know it's, it we became a phenomenon. You know, we were all quite surprised by it as well. And uh, Arnold comes in; he was still working for as a translator and fixer for Western journalists uh, for journalist uh, organizations, and he came in with a a film crew from West German or German United German television. I believe it was and, uh, and he came in to do a television show on our bookstore. And uh, I don't think he knew that I was involved with it or not, but I basically bump, bumped into him in the bookstore and I was like, ah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? What do you, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we had a little mini reunion. We caught up and it was great to see him actually. Right. So, um, I th- from, from what I understand is you, you discovered a little bit more about, Arno and his background as well. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's how it is, right? I mean, you know, 
And we, you know, I worked at the bookstore. Then I moved back to New York for a few years. I worked for Bloomberg uh, there. And, um, you know, all this spy versus spy 1980 stuff, it receded back into my mind. I never even thought about it. You know, uh, it was almost as if it didn't happen. And, um, and uh, I came back um, from New York in 19, um, 80, 1997 or 1998, it was. And um, I took a job with Radio for Europe here based in, in Prague at the time. And um, that was my life. Uh, you know, I was, I was living here. I never thought of Arnold one time in 10 years. And then so fast forward to a few years ago, 2014, I wrote 2014 in my blog, but it could easily have been 2013. Uh, I was sitting in my kitchen, a little bit bored. I have my computer open. I have my Google. And I'm like, wow, I wonder what ever happened to Arnold. You know, what, what, what could have happened to him? I, you know, he was, he was 60 when we were together, you know, it's uh, working together. So that would have put him some, somewhere in the 80s. You know, he could conceivably still be alive. So, um, so I Googled his name and uh, I looked at the results and there was basically nothing. He had vanished, which was so strange. And I thought, well, was that not his real name or what, what was that? And then I was scrolling down through the results. You know, there was another Arnold Kyleberth who was a director in a German orchestra or something in the 1920s was filled with him. And, uh, and then I got down to the page and there was one mention of my Arnold. It was a report that was put by the Czech Security Services Archive and the Prague Institute, the Czech, Czechoslovak Institute of Military History. And it was uh, a, P- a link to a PDF and it was called Arnold Kyleberth, um, journalist and member of the state security services. It was in Czech. Of course, I could read that. And, um, and my blood ran cold. It's like, wow. You know, so, so, so now you were able to find out what, what yes, he was really so about. Okay, exactly. All the things that Arnold never told me in all of our meetings, all the times when we were just talking about nonsense over beers and talking about his daughter and university in Austria and his father or his grandfather was the ambassador to Canada, blah, blah, blah. Now I get the real story. 20 pages of very intensively researched documentation by a very neutral institute here in Prague. I mean, this is not a bunch of guys, academics who are, who want to shame ex-communists and expose them. This is a bunch of researchers like chemists in a lab who are simply trying to look at history and trying to see it in an, in an objective way. And, um, you know, um, I linked to the report on my blog. You can read it. It's written in very dense and legalistic Czech. Um, you know, you can run it through Google Translate if you want. You'll get the basic, uh, you'll get the basic idea of it. And it paints a completely different and varied story of Arnold, some stuff that he never told us. And I was just floored, basically shocked. So tell me more. Come on. You can't, like, you can't leave <laughs> it like that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to read the blog. To get well, the no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna provide links to the, um, to the blogs. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm just teasing it. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Uh, all of my worst fears of Arnold were basically confirmed. You know, um, it was the opinion of that report, and I later met the author of the report, a man named Prokop Tomek, who works at the institute here in Prague. Very nice man. Um, that Arnold was a dedicated the. The, the unambiguous um, um, conclusion of the report was that Arnold was a dedicated, uh, faithful, talented member of the state security services over a long period of time that Arnold had uh, joined. That It was a very fascinating story. Can I summarize it just in a couple Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, you know, you would imagine the name Arnold Kyleberth doesn't sound very Czech. Well, it turns out that Arnold was actually... Um, ethnic German. He was a Sudeten German from family. Um, if you know the history of the Second World War, you know that after the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II, millions of Sudeten Germans were expelled from Czechoslovakia in 1946 and 47. Um, it was basically not good to be German or German-speaking in, the, in Czechoslovakia in those years. It was very difficult um, for Arnold had the uh, good fortune, though, before the war, just as the Germans were invading Czechoslovakia, to be shipped off by his parents to Britain to ride out the war years uh, in, in school in Britain, in high school, actually, and he even graduated from a design college or a technical college there. So he had a degree from a British school 
and came back as a young man after the war, I believe in 1947, 48, 49, something like that. Um, so Arnold, uh, uh, Dr. Tomek told me that, Arnold's, uh, that Arnold had spent so many years in Britain that he had basically lost his check, uh, or maybe as an ethnic German, he never really had good check. Um, so, you know, he came to this country actually not speaking the language and not really being part of the culture. So he assimilated himself into the culture, you know, must have taken a crash course in, in Czech. Um, he rose up through the trade unions, was very successful in the 1960s. Um, in the mid-1960s, um, because of his German language skills, his German ethnicity, um, he was very instrumental or rather instrumental in in um, in maintaining Czechoslovakia's relations to Western Germany or West Germany. You know, uh, West Germany and Czechoslovakia didn't have formal diplomatic relations for many years after World War II. So a lot of their bilateral contacts were through informal organizations like trade unions and you know, other professional organizations. And uh, Arnold made a career basically as a diplomat in these sort of informal channels. He also became a communist in the 1950s. He joined the, uh, the state security services, the STB, around that time as well, sometime in the late 50s or 1960, early 1960s. So um, Arnold was, a, you know, a, 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 a rather important and dedicated spy and communist for many years. Okay. So what was his position over the Prague Spring? What happened to him around about that period? Right. Okay, that's where, that's where Arnold's story gets very interesting, I think, because... Um, you know, he, like many communists and like many people of his generation, many Czechs and you know, Czechoslovaks you know, have to be a communist to feel this way, greatly encouraged by the reform movement in Czechoslovakia that was going on in the mid, by the time it was gaining steam by the mid 1960s. And particularly when we get to 1967, 1968, with the rise of Alexander Dubček as the first secretary of the communist party, as the country's leader, um, you know, there was a feeling, a real feeling of optimism in this country that things were changing, that there was the possibility to find some kind of middle way between East and West that would allow for free expression that, you know, might keep the state ownership of the, product, the means of production, but at the same time would allow for some more political, cultural expression, etc. Anyway, Arnold sided with the reformers, and um, like many did, many did, most, most people did, obviously. And then... Um, you know, of course, uh, at the time, uh, under Brezhnev, the Soviet Union was very conservative. They looked with uh, great worry about what was going on in Czechoslovakia. And finally, in August, on August 21st, 1968, pulled the trigger. They led a, an invasion of the country by several Warsaw Pact members, you know, led by the Soviet Union, but involving most of them except Romania. And, um, and they put down the, the, this type of reform movement, you might call it political reform movement, the Prague Spring, uh, they put this down with military means. And um, any communist who had sided with the reformers over time lost their job, lost their position. Arnold was booted out of the Communist Party and was uh, booted out of the STB, the State Security Services. He lost that. Uh, and inst and uh, he was assigned a, a new job in the National Catering Service, relatively low you know, not a very important organization politically and a relatively low job in that organization. So that's basically where Arnold was after 68, riding out the 1970s. Okay, so, but somehow he works his way back into the STB. It's a mystery. It's a total mystery. You know, even, even Tomek doesn't know exactly how he did it because he was so discredited, you know, pushed out on the margins. Um, I guess, uh, you know, Arnold had, you know, was a very enterprising guy. Um, came up and he also had the linguistic skills that they needed and um, you know he maybe at some level was a true believer so um, you know slowly through the 1970s and the early 1980s he manages to squirm and work his way back into that state security apparatus and by the time I roll into the picture in the mid 1980s Arnold has gotten back pretty much everything that he's lost you know he had a beautiful house you know, that I, that I had visited myself, um, you know, you know, he was trusted to handle us whom the state, uh, who the Czechoslovak state was convinced were a bunch of um, CIA agents basically. And, uh, German television. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he had a lot of, um, you know, he was a trusted member of, of, of that society, you know, that, that, uh, security apparatus. Wow. 
So, so you're not holding it back for another blog post, are you, Mark? <laughs> no, I'm not. Going no, back. I know, I know, I know, I know you're not. But uh, wow, that's that's really intriguing. And have you ever, you know, tried to find out more? Are there other archives in uh, the Czech Republic that would assist you with finding yes. out more? Uh, yes, a few years ago, actually, and I asked Tomek the same thing, Dr. Tomek, the, the author of the report on Arnold. Um, um, uh, a few years ago, I actually hired a researcher to go to the Interior Ministry here in Prague and to see if my name was in any of the files, because you know we have a right to apply for you know to, to see our own files now under the under the under the laws, and um, and uh, I, you know I was told that those files don't exist or never existed, which you know is is fine with me. And then I asked. I asked oh, surely that's well. rather disappointing. You must have thought that you were a person of interest to them. Well, you know what? <laughs> um, this, uh, yeah, I was actually. You're right. I was disappointed at the time because you know I wanted to know what was what was going on. I was actually kind of relieved and disappointed at the same time. I don't know if there's a, a, a right. I don't know what the right word for that is, but it's a it's a complicated emotion. Um, anyway, I asked Dr. Tomek. I had coffee with him talking about Arnold. You know, there's the, you know some you know some questions I had for him about the report and stuff. And then I asked him, I said, look, you know, you have access to all those archives. Would you go back in and would you look and see if my name or if Business International or, if, you know, if my colleagues or company, you know, are mentioned in any of those files? And he sent me a, a note a, a couple of weeks ago or, you know, a couple of weeks after rather. And he said that all of the files between 1987 and 1990 concerning Arnold had been destroyed, were gone, were vanished. So that means to him that Arnold was a very important person because after the, you know, after the fall of the regime, he had enough power to get somebody to get in there and destroy those files. So presumably if, 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 you know, if I was ever mentioned, you know, who knows, um, I would have also, my, you know, my name would have also been destroyed with those files, which is, you know, like, like I said, in my blog post, whatever, <laughs> fine with Wow. Me. And also the fact that Arnold had such a small presence on, uh, on Google, in search results, you know, that's kind of like a mark of a job well done if you're a former spy. If you see yeah. I mean, if he's extended his secrecy to Google, he's doing yes. better than most of us. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, Tomek had nothing but respect for uh, Arnold, actually, at least in terms of his spy craft and his ability to survive in any system somehow even though he ended up being on the wrong side of 68 and was in danger of overplaying his cards and being on the wrong side of 89. Quite ironic. Wow. And so uh, what's your view of Arnold now? I mean, how, how do you feel about him? You know, I, I've lived in the Czech Republic now for 20 years, more than 20 years, and I've met a lot of people who probably didn't have to play the high stakes Make the, make the high stakes decisions that Arnold had to make with his own life, but were buffeted by the same historical forces and 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 could be seen as being, um, you know, um, a collaborator somehow with the regime. At the same time, a resistor to the regime. It really depended. So, I mean, you know, in a sense, everybody's got a little bit of moral mud on their shoes, you know, more or less, so to speak. So. You know, I don't feel like it would be fair for me to be like very critical of Arnold. You know, I, I and I try to understand the motivations, etc. So, no, I mean, I you know, I certainly bear no no grudges at all. I mean, you know, it's just a very interesting character, and I and you know, on some level, I feel you know almost privileged to have hung out with the guy and, and learned something about um, about that whole. Side yeah. of life I mean, he seemed to be able to work his way through the system quite well and, and even reinvent himself when he got on the wrong side of them. He, he was a perfect everyman somehow, you know, in a sense. Uh, even Tomek said the same thing. He said somehow he was, he was unobtrusive enough to survive, yet talented enough to make himself necessary somehow, you know, right in that middle range. Wow. That's a that's a, a fascinating story. Um, I wanted to ask you a few other other questions while I had you. Okay. Um, so, have you got any like souvenirs that you've kept from your your period in Prague in the eighties? Well, I do have all of my I do have all of my uh, my my papers, of course, you know, mm -hmm. and little you know tickets and ticket stubs and all that stuff. But um, 
as I've become a travel writer, um, I've become interested in what I call guidebook archaeology, in that I buy or obtain, try to get in some way, uh, old guidebooks, and then revisit places to see if I can tell how they've changed and what changes they might have undergone in the intervening yeah. years. So, you know, I have a nice collection of guidebooks about Prague in the 1980s. You know, there were no commercial guidebooks. You know, Western publishers didn't have guidebooks on Czechoslovakia in the 1980s. But the, the Czechs themselves and the tourist stuff and stuff, they, they had a lot of nice little glossy publications and stuff. So um, I really enjoy that. So, you know, I have five or six books on my shelf. And, you know, sometimes I'll pull one off the shelf and take a walk around Prague and see, well, this was a very trendy bar at one point in 1984 or something like that. Now it might be completely closed down or something completely yeah. different. Wow. Uh, that's, that's kind of and, my, that's kind of my hobby. And I presume a lot of street name changes between then and now as well. Metro station changes. That's been the big thing, you know, yeah. like we, we had a Metro station here that was named after Clement Gottwald, Gottwald. And now it's a uh, Vichyrad, you know, completely different. Yeah. You know. Now, I, I think, I don't know whether I mentioned this to you, but I was in Prague in 1981. Um, I was there on holiday for oh. uh, a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. and wow. I, I actually... See a, I see a blog post here. <laughs> well, here we go. Here we go. Um, and I actually visited the Clement Gottwald Museum, which I can safely say is probably one of the most boring <laughs> museums. Yes. I've ever visited, but I still have a pin that I bought there, a little yeah. badge pin. That is a very famous building. It once belonged to the Czechoslovak Savings Bank. Yeah, and, and yeah. I was back in Prague earlier this year yeah. and uh, found the same building because yes. I found a post, some obscure post somewhere um, about it. But um, It's changed a lot. There's no museum. And, and there are, you know, I was actually early days living in Prague. I think it must've been in the 1990s sometime. I was walking past the building one morning on my way to work, I guess. And I actually saw them taking the, the letters down from the Clement Gulf. Well, there were workers pulling the letters off the side of the building, Wow, which would have been a great photo. Which I yeah. Yeah. I presume most of that ended in a skip somewhere. Yeah. Unfortunately. Um, so th- what locations would you recommend in Prague that people visit to, you know, understand, you know, Czechoslovakia during the, the Cold War? That's kind of funny. I mean, a lot of the espionage and a lot of the kind of spy versus spy stuff took place in the diplomatic quarter, in embassies, in hotel rooms. Um, you know, if you are going on Wenceslas Square, which is the big square, of course, in the center of town where, you know, as uh, history would have it, where most of the Velvet Revolution protests took place, at least the early ones. And it's also the place where that iconic moment where you had Dubček and Havel on the balcony on a building that is now a Marks and Spencer, if you can believe it. But what I'm going to tell you about where people could go to see the older stuff, the real spy stuff, the Hotel Yalta is also on Wenceslas Square. It's across the street from that Marks and Spencer, actually, and up, up, up the hill a little bit. Um, that's uh, a building where a lot of journalists had to stay. I never stayed there myself. Uh, it was, you know, intensively monitored and bugged. And uh, you can now go downstairs and they've preserved the bugging equipment. So you can see that if you want. It's actually built uh, above a, a very small nuclear bunker uh, or a survival bunker. I don't know if it was a nuclear bunker, but I mean, it was a place where people could go in the event of wartime. And that's still been retained, but you can also see that. That was such a strange hotel for the regime to put journalists because just this, the location is right in the middle of where the action was, you know, and any journalist could simply walk out on their balcony and watch everything that was going down on, on Wenceslas Square. So not a very smart place to put your journalists, you know, I think. Yeah. Um, there's another hotel that's uh, very close to the square. Um, the Alcron Hotel had the very similar situation. Um, although I don't think that the bugging equipment has survived, and I don't think, you know, it's a pretty fancy hotel. It's actually owned by the Radisson, Radisson Corporation now. Um, You've got me that, worried now because that's where I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, where I used to stay, and I wrote a blog post, I used to stay at the Intercontinental Hotel. You know, there were only a handful of hotels where you could stay in Prague in the 1980s as a journalist. And the Intercontinental Hotel 
would be a great place to go just to see a little bit because, I mean, that was the cream of the crop. That's where the wealthy German businessmen were coming in. That's if you wanted to have a little side business where you could sell some prostitution services, some money-changing services to some wealthy Westerners coming in, you would camp out there. And of course, because of the opportunity to make so much money, the Communist Party had their headquarters or more or less had a regional unofficial headquarters, perhaps, uh, in that building. And uh, it's still around. Still, it's a nice hotel. It's still owned by the, well, still maintained or run by the Intercontinental uh, Hotels uh, Group. Um, but I stayed there several times on on, on my uh, uh, on my trips to Prague. And um, you know, can I tell you a little story about the Intercontinental? Yeah, sure. Go on. Go for it. Okay. We like a tangent. Oh, uh, we got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is a tangent. Okay. I had just arrived from Vienna on one of these train trips. You know, who knows if I met a, a sultry you know, young agent or not. I can't remember on this particular trip. But I do remember that Arnold picked me up at the train station and took me right to the Intercontinental Hotel, helped me check in, you know, said good night, and basically I was in for the night. Um, so, you know, maybe I took a walk around the hotel or something to get my bearings. It was probably 7, 8, 9 p.m. or something like that at, at night. Um, I didn't feel like going to a restaurant, so I decided, well, I'll just take some room service in my room. I went upstairs uh, to, to the room, called down to the reception desk, ordered some food. The waiter brought it in on the little rolling tray, knocked on the door, you know, brought the tray into my room, closed the door. I ate the food, probably studied for my meetings the next day or watched a little TV or whatever you do, and uh, went to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, the tray was gone from my room. And it was very strange. I thought, hmm, I don't remember anybody knocking or anything. Maybe they had a pass key and they just, you know, they, I don't know, maybe somebody came in and took the tray. I didn't know. I didn't think too much about it. I thought, well, they just took their tray, you know, this is Czechoslovakia. That's how they do it. I went downstairs to the breakfast buffet. Um, it, was a, it was a cash buffet at that time. I put my eggs on my tray or whatever. I went to the cashier. I reached into my wallet. I pulled out my wallet. I went to pay. It was totally cleaned down. Everything, all the money that, that I had gotten from Vienna for that trip was gone. So it was a very strange uh, moment because maybe they have a rogue, you know, uh, bellboy or something like that. Or more likely, maybe this was simply a way for the regime to say, we don't like it when you come here. We're going to make it very difficult for you. You know, yeah, we're watching you. Back. We're very we're close to you. you. Yeah. Yes, wow. Exactly. It was crazy. I was totally concerned, you know, because it made me look like a total idiot, you know, a, a greenhorn, you know, from Vienna, whatever. You know, of course, Arnold came by at nine or something to pick me up at the hotel. I told him, you know, look, we have to go to the police station. I, I need some money. I don't have anything. There was no ATMs, of course. You know, I didn't even know how Vienna could wire me money in Czechoslovakia back then. So, um, so um, he said, oh, no, no, don't worry. We'll take care of it. He didn't seem to be the slightest bit concerned. Instead of going to the police station, at the police station, we actually went to a window downstairs at the Intercontinental Hotel. I actually lodged a police report there at the window, which was so strange to me, you know. It was a yeah. police officer, a typewriter, the whole thing. And, uh, it, you know, it didn't dawn on me till later that obviously this was a total inside job. I mean, you know, everybody was in on it. It was a Potemkin village. It was, a, it was an active theater. Arnold probably knew about it, you know. They were probably laughing their asses off, you know, thinking yeah. about it. You know? Yeah. So uh, did you leave your chair jammed against the door f for uh, future nights there? <laughs> yes, I learned some tricks, you know, <laughs> keep your key in the lock, use the chain, you know, uh, yeah. thing by God, oh, for God's sakes. I mean, I learned a lot on these trips, but, you know. Wow. That is, yeah. No, that, that's, a, that, that, that's, a, that's a great story. Yeah. So I, 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 I was going to ask you... Um, <laughs> whether there's anything about the STP that you think people might be unaware of. And probably one of it would be uh, that they came into your hotel room. <laughs> I <think laughs> Possibly. That, I, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, by the time I rolled into town, you know, people weren't getting dragged off and beaten or, you know, left in ditches or anything like that. The, 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 the type of, the type of counter espionage, espionage, whatever that game was, was played very much on the level of making it inconvenient for you to do something. You know, oftentimes I would arrive in Prague and the hotel would, would lose my reservation or um, would tell me that, unfortunately, we have a night, we have a room for you on Monday and 
Tuesday and one on Thursday and Friday. But unfortunately, we're fully booked on Wednesday. So of course, you'd have to spend the rest of the week trying to find a place to sleep for Wednesday. You know, I mean, they realized that these little pieces of inconvenience were, you know, would at least dissuade you from wanting to come back in the future. Like, no, I don't want to go there. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Now, I did have some other questions which are not necessarily about your um, trips to Prague. I, I was going to ask you if if you were a filmmaker, what Cold War incident would you recreate on film and why? But um, w- would it be your work you know, with uh, art? Well, not work, but... <laughs> I think yeah, my well, yes, my yeah. my collaboration. Your collaboration. Yes, yeah, exactly. yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to put yeah, this yeah, dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. But but go on. What 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 would you think? You know, uh, I've lived here long enough to realize and seen so many Czech films about historical uh, periods of history. You know, historical films were very popular in the last few years here in Prague in the Czech film industry. They've done lots of remakes about the Nazi occupation about the First Republic, the period before the German invasion, and, of course, some stories during the communist period. And they're still not very convincing to me somehow. I mean, they're overly stylized. Uh, they're too rich. The people are too good-looking in the movies. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's too cinematic somehow to be real for me. But one place where Czechs really excel at filmmaking, at least they have in the past, is making comedies. So I think if I were going to make a a movie about my experiences or about the Cold War or something like that, I would make a comedy and maybe make it like of that Pozitsky affair, you know, that we didn't talk about that I write about in my blog where it's kind of like uh, an in-house sting operation where where the STB tried to catch one of their own in making this phony deal with an American diplomat. Um, I mean, I think that there's so much material for a funny comedy because you know, let's face it, if the Czechs weren't in my, the average Czech person in, in my, at least in my impression, you know, maybe one of your listeners could, you know, tell me that I'm not right, but I didn't get the feeling that they took all of this stuff that seriously, you know, somehow. I don't think that there were a lot of firm believers. You know, I think a lot of people were forced into very awkward situations that would could be treated comically, you know, very convincingly. Actually. Yeah. Well, it is the home of... Uh... Good Soldier Schweik, isn't it? Yeah, Good Soldier Schweik. And I'm thinking <laughs> about some of those those films that Milos Forman made in the 1960s, you know, those black-white uh, new wave films that came out of Czechoslovakia in the 60s. They, yeah. were, they were tragedies, but they were comedies, you know, and, and I think that those films are just they're just genius. They still stand up to this day. Yeah. So, Great. You know. No, I like that. I like that. So what, what sort of music do you think you'd have as a soundtrack? Right. Okay. I'm obsessed with this communist pop that was you know that came out in the 1960s and even in the 1970s of course with the singers that were willing to go along with the regime or were not discredited by the regime like carl god for instance which is a you know a, a, a czech singer was extremely popular still alive still extremely popular um and also a very popular singer in germany you know his records were sold all around central europe during in his heyday yeah um to me those Czech pop from the 1960s and 70s feels very synthetic. It feels very much like it was a conscious imitation of what was going on in the in, in the West. You know, of course, people mm-hmm. here just see hear the music and think, well, it's just pop. But I hear it from a different way, and it also sounds very spooky to me because it echo brings back those old times. And there's a, an ethereal quality to it. So, if I were going to make a movie about those times, I would use period music definitely. Right. Can, well, I'd, if you can find me some YouTube links or something like that to Absolutely. some examples, I'd be really uh, keen to put those on the show notes. And I Absolutely. will be linking to your blog so that people can learn more about the Porichi affair. Did you say? Pozitsky uh, affair. Pozitsky affair. Because I, I, exactly. I want to leave them tantalized, you see. Oh, okay. And I'm not, I don't want to give everything away here. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's you. the technique we use on Cold War it. conversations. Yeah, so um, if you could invite three personalities from the Cold War, living or dead, to have a few drinks with, who would they be? Well, you know, obviously, you know, we've centered this around one particular individual, this conversation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, I, it, I wouldn't mind having one last beer with Arnold. Yeah. Just to ask him some basic questions, you know, like, um, you know, you know, maybe to fill out a little bit of his uh, his bio, 
um, maybe to ask, you know, what they really did think about us at Business International in Vienna back in those days. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then maybe to try to answer that question that even um, the report on Arnold couldn't answer, like, why? You know, what, why did he do this in the 1980s? You know, what was the motivation? There? Was it money? Was it ideology? Was it some, was it anger? Yeah. You know, I never really understood yeah. what, what drove that guy. Yeah. I mean, presumably it could have been pressure because I think you said in your blog, his daughter was studying in Vienna. Yes, 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 yes. Well, uh, yeah, so, and I'm sure that he had some tuition bills to pay. He yeah. Bill as well. Well, they could have withdrawn her ability to, because could you easily leave Czechoslovakia? if you were a Czech citizen during the Cold War, or was it as sealed in as East Germany? No, you could, you could, but you had to, um, basically the survival, and not the survival, literal survival, but the economic survival and well-being of all the people you left behind would very much depend on whether you came back or not. So, yeah, you know, I mean, if you were a trusted, if you were a trusted family member of a trusted individual, you basically had to come back or those family individuals were no longer going to be trusted. Yeah. Yeah, be bad. So, yeah, I, I didn't get the feeling that, you know, she was that they were particularly privileged because she was studying, but it didn't jibe exactly with the idea of a dissident out of out of sorts, you know, kicking yeah. the communist. I mean, it was it, it didn't add up. You know, yeah. Time. OK, OK. So, let me tell you another person I'd like to sit down with. Go on. It could be anybody from Eastern Europe and government at those times of the highest echelons, because I'd really like to know what they were thinking when they were seeing that perestroika wave hit Eastern Europe, you know, did they think that they were going to lose power or did they not, you know, did they think that they could resist and hold out or were they really looking for any type of escape? You know, um, that, 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 that was a very unwelcome development coming out of the Soviet Union at that time by the hardline regimes in Eastern Europe. Well, I guess, and, and and also the fact that you know Gorbachev had said that he would not send Soviet troops in. Um, yes, and that was the whole thing that was almost holding up the House of Cards, wasn't it? Yes, 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 yes. The regimes no longer had that last card that they could play against any type of protest movement or something like that. Yeah, no, I mean it was the you know in retrospect the writing is on the wall right from the start, and you know these guys should have made better plans to get out of power and, and do it you know, so that they could at least hold on to their money or their position or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I really want to know, you know, what, what they were thinking, you know, how they were viewing that. Yeah. Like, you know, no, I, I'm, I'm with you there. That, yeah, that would exactly. be interesting. You've got one other character you can invite. Oh dear. But you don't need, you don't have to, it can be two. <laughs> oh, you want two? How about Nikolai Ceausescu and his wife, Elena? <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> You know, the, my other yeah, yeah. side light, you know, as a travel writer, you have to kind of like have a, a few, a few, you know, different uh, clubs in the golf cart, you know. Um, and one of the countries that I've taken a, a, a real pet interest in, and, you know, even more, I, I really enjoy going there and writing about it is Romania. And uh, that fascinates me too completely because, you know, Ian, maybe someday pl- please try to find a Romanian expert on, for your podcast and talk, uh, talk to him because we still don't really know what happened in 1989. No, I I, so I do want to do a podcast on uh, Romania. So right. if you can give me any leads on anybody, I'm I'm still on the lookout for for somebody would, who might I be. I would like I would like to sit down with a serious academic historian and talk about what we know and what we don't know um, that happened from night from December seventeenth, nineteen eighty nine, from the first protests to one week later when he is captured and executed. That is an amazingly short amount of time for yeah. an iron grip dictator to fall uh, from power like that. It's just uh, it's just amazing. When did the army switch and why and all those uh, all those questions? So you know, just you know, that would be my third person. Just, okay, you know, perfect. We can do that. You know, we can really do that. Like, yeah, no, on. absolutely. I think we could we could potentially we could do a panel it. discussion there and have <laughs> you involved. So. Um, <laughs> I'll uh, I'll put that down as a future program. That that oh, yeah. that sounds Please good. Do. So, are there are there any books in or a book in English that you could recommend for anybody right. interested in Czechoslovakia during the Cold War? Right. I guess the 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 person everybody would talk about would be Milan Kundera, but I would I would say something else. I mean, um, one of his contemporaries still living, actually a concentration camp survivor. Um, he wrote. 
uh, several books, uh, collections of short stories. I'm talking about Ivan Klima. Uh, he yep. wrote little stories like My Merry Mornings or Love and Garbage. Uh, and these are vignettes of everyday life in communist Czechoslovakia. And they're, they're just, you know, they're just beautifully told stories, but they're also richly personal stories. They're kind of raunchy in a certain sense, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, it, for me that like shows the other side of life under communism because, you know, it wasn't all this, you know, spy versus spy and gray stuff. I mean, you know, people had normal lives. They went yeah. to summer cottages, you know, it was you know, kind of normal life. And it always seems to be like, he, you know, he's working as an orderly in a hospital and he spies an attractive nurse and pretty soon they're having coffee on their break time and trying to sneak out somewhere in the back room. And it's like, you know, hey, that's real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. No, that, and, and I find that it's, it's the uh, ordinariness is the wrong word, but sort of like it's how people just got on with their lives under these sort of regimes and how they managed to find a way through the bureaucracy and the, yeah, the ideology. I, you know, I, I find it, you know, to be, I find those, those writings, and there are lots of other, you know, there are lots of other Czech writers too who covered the same term that kind of humanize the system, you know, that sort of, flesh it out a little bit more and, and let you get out of the stereotypical thinking just a little bit. You know, when you think about yeah. those old times. Okay. Well, I'll add those books to the, um, to the show notes. Now you were uh, a little bit disparaging about, um, Czech films or TV series that, uh, represent Czechoslovakia during the, during the cold war. It's, are there any films out there? I mean, I've surprised that nobody's made a film about the, the Prague Spring and Dubček and him getting shipped to Moscow and the negotiations and no, all of that. No, 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 there isn't. There's, um, you know, there, uh, there's an old Costa Gavras film. I think it's called the confession. Uh, oh, okay. Do you, do you remember, does that ring a bell? You know, he was, a you know, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the film player. director. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'll look that up. It's, I haven't seen it since grad school, so I don't even know, you know, if there are surviving copies around. But it's the story of the Slansky trial um, in the early 1950s. The yeah. Anti, you know, the kind of like the purge trials, you know. Sort of yeah, because they've recently found some contemporary film of the um, the trial, I think. Right. So I have a feeling that there's going to be, um, I have a feeling there must be something in the works. And if they can use that material in some way, then it would be a goldmine. Um, there's an HBO um, documentary. It's a three part. It's not really a documentary. It's fictional, but it's based on real life events. It was mm -hmm. the story of Jan Pollack, a yep. student who, um, who uh, set himself on fire to protest the Warsaw Pact invasion. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's very good. Actually. Right. So, you know, you can find that. It's called oh, okay. English. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I did see a, a film of, um, it was about a Czech woman who had been arrested by the Nazis. She was a politician um, and she was eventually hung by the communist government. Um, you mean uh, Milada Horakova? That's the one. That's yeah. the one. Yes, yes, yes. That, that was, was good. That was excellent. Yeah, you can put that in the show notes as well. That's an excellent story. You know, she's, you know, she's uh, one of the most prominent victims of those purge and show trials of the 1950s, I guess, the early 50s, yeah. the late 40s and early 50s. And, and um, you know, she's a, as a real historical figure. I mean, there's yeah. a very prominent street in the neighborhood that I live in that's named after her. Right. And also the fact that she was, you know, arrested by the Nazis, was in prison. Where, well, she was in a concentration camp, I think. Um, and then, you know, had that happened to her in the post-war years. Um, no, it's a good, good, yeah, good film. Um, Mark, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Oh, wonderful. Um, it's been a, a fascinating evening's um, chat and some really good insight into Czechoslovakia during the Cold War and what it would right. be like, you know, what it was like to uh, actually work there. So I'm really appreciative of your time. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to share some of the stories. Well, that was it with our Cold War conversation with Mark. I'm hoping to get him back soon again to discuss the Cold War again. If you'd like to understand more about the subjects, books and films we discussed, 
There's links in the show notes at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number nine. Don't forget you can join our discussion group on Facebook. Just search for Cold War Conversations and we're on Twitter at Cold War Pod. If you like what you're hearing, please do leave reviews on iTunes or with your podcast provider. Thank you very much for listening. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. (laughs) 